This is the fifth. This is the fourth message in this series because I got off track a little bit. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, I've used this passage of scripture out of all the gospels because I just like it. It just, it just stands for what we believe here. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 says, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Father, we thank you today for your word. Be our preacher and our teacher in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a law of nature. And that law of nature is to experience purpose and meaning and fulfillment in our lives personally and individually. We must have a cause greater than ourselves. Now I want to say that again. It is a law of nature. In order for us to experience purpose, meaning, and fulfillment in, in our everyday living, in our innermost being, we have to have a cause greater than ourself for which to live. Now, it's true that a measure of fulfillment can be achieved through one's vocation or through one's service that we give to our church or that we give to our community or some service organization or through our devotion for our family. And all of those things are great and they're awesome and we can get some measure of fulfillment through those things. <clears throat> but the truth of the matter is that complete fulfillment, complete fulfillment, that is fulfillment at the very highest or deepest level of one's being, cannot be achieved apart from a very personal, intimate relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7, 8, and 9, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own, watch this word, purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. In Genesis chapter 2, because Paul talked about before the world began in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 the Bible says and the Lord God formed man in the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul I have talked to a lot of people in my 50 years of preaching I have ministered to a lot of people in my 50 years of preaching and I've talked to a lot of people who claim to be atheists and a lot of people who claim to be agnostics and on and on and on. But I have found this, that all men who will be honest with themselves are conscious of the belief that there is more to life than just our time on this earth. Sometimes they don't want you to know that they believe that, and sometimes they want to be macho about the fact that they are atheists. But I can promise you that most atheists, if not all the atheists I've ever known before they die, when they get in a dying situation, decide they aren't atheists anymore. Jeremiah chapter... 29 verse 11, another one of my favorite passages of scripture. I use it a lot. I use it in weddings and I use it a lot in my own life personally. And it says this, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and hope. Psalm 138 verse 8 says, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. It is obvious from studying the Word of God 
that God had something in mind when he created humanity, and the thing that he had in mind was a purpose. And when God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into him this nostrils, this breath of life, the truth of the matter is this, God's purpose was for us to know his purpose for us. However, most of us somehow along in our journey, spiritual journey or, or just flesh journey, <laughs> seem to be struggling trying to find out what that purpose is. God did not create us and then wind us up like a watch and say, now you're on your own, do your own thing. The Bible says that God came down in the cool of the day and met with Adam and Eve in the garden and he fellowshiped with them. In all that God had created, nothing was capable of having fellowship with God. Animals are not able, are not capable to have fellowship with God because God did not bestow on animals that capability. Only mankind, only you and me have the capabilities of having fellowship with holy, sovereign God of creation. You see, when God designed mankind, He reserved a space in man's heart just for himself. (coughs) Now, y'all just hang on with me because this is the first time, well, it's not the first time since my surgery, but it's the first time I've tried to preach since my surgery that my throat is trying to act up on me. I talked to the doctor about it Thursday, and he said, don't worry about it, it'll get better. (laughs) And I said, thank you. So if it sounds like I've got something rattling inside of my throat, it's because I've got something rattling inside of my throat. (laughs) So don't sit out there on pins and needles and think, oh my God, preacher's going to lose his voice. I'm not going to lose my voice, trust me. Or I would have already when I was kicking. No, that's another story. When God created humanity, he reserved a space in in my heart and in your heart. There was a place in my heart that God reserved just for himself. Now, I want you to listen carefully. I I want you to watch me. In that space in your heart, in the innermost recesses of your being, Nothing has the capacity to fill that space except for God himself. Not your job, not your family, not your money, not your dreams, not your goals, not your church, not your baptism. None of that stuff can fill that space that God reserved for himself. And then there are people trying to live their life And they're trying to find an achievement. They're trying to find fulfillment. They're trying to find peace. They're trying to find an innermost something in their life. And they're trying to find it through all the wrong places. They're trying meditation and they're trying drugs and they're trying drink and they're trying food and they're trying sex and they're trying all of the other things But at the end of the day, they're still in the midnight hour and emptiness that still hasn't been fulfilled. There is something there that that we long for, that we thirst for. Augustine said this, without God, man begins at no beginning and works to no ending. Augustine simply put it this way, without 
God, man, has a meaningless experience. One which has been reduced to the level of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. In other words, without God, humanity is trying to squeeze as many pleasures out of life as we possibly can because at death it all ends. And that kind of thinking causes mankind to live life with no joy and no peace and no expectancy. Ernest Hemingway, that name rings a bell with you because he rose to the top of humanity. He won the Nobel and the Pulitzer Prizes in literature. Hemingway was rich and famous and free to live any way that he pleased. Hemingway had a saying, and this is what he said. If he got to the top and found it empty, he would not want to go any further. <clears throat> Ernest Hemingway got to the top and he found it empty. And he took a gun and blew his brains out. Let me get scriptural for a moment. King Solomon immersed himself in wealth and power and prestige in every kind of pleasure imaginable to mankind. Solomon was an amazing individual. He had so many wives and so many concubines that if he spent one night with every wife and every concubine, it would take him 10 years to get back to the first one. That's when one of their vitamins came into existence. <clears throat> Solomon found an amazing truth. He found that none of those things brought purpose or meaning or fulfillment in his life. Temporary purpose, yes. Lasting purpose, no. So Solomon wrote these words in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2. Vanity of all vanities, all is vanity. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2 reads like this in the Hebrew. Everything is meaningless, completely meaningless. Even though Solomon had fulfilled every purpose and everything that he thought that would offer him something in life, at the end of the day, there was nothing, no purpose, no meaning, no fulfillment. And so, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25 says, the pleasures of sin for a season. After man's sensual desires have been satisfied and after the applause had died down and after the party is over in his emptiness he cannot help but feel there must be something more there must be something more noble something more enduring something more worthwhile for which to live than this and thank God there is <clears throat> God created us for his purpose for the joy that we would bring to him now, I want you to understand what I'm saying. God created for this purpose, and that purpose is for the joy that we would bring to our Heavenly Father. Bringing God's highest pleasure to pass, bestowing on Him the love and devotion of our hearts is the highest calling that you and I can ever have. In our text, Jesus tells us what God's greatest desire for man is when he said, the first and the greatest commandment that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. 
And then we, he went on, Jesus said, to love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, you listen to me today. I've said it until my breath is sometimes short. But if you get these two right, you've got it right. If you can love God with all your heart and your mind and your soul and neighbors yourself, then you are bringing the greatest joy to your heavenly Father. It's not your preaching and it's not your singing and it's not your shouting and it's not your playing. It's not your, all of the, none of, listen, listen, all of those things are awesome. But I can tell you this, that lost people can sing and lost people can pray and lost people can pick and lost people can can teach and lost people can preach and lost people can come to church and lost people can be baptized. But I'm telling you, it takes somebody different to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and love your neighbor as yourself. And when you get that right, you've got it right, and you're bringing joy and pleasure and honor and praise to the heart of God. Say you're right, preacher. I'm fixing to get in trouble, but that's okay. I've been in trouble one time before. <clears throat> Say you're right, preacher. You're right, preacher. Now, if you think I'm right, then why are you acting like a bunch of horses patoots around people? <laughs> Hello? Why are you allowing Satan to ha- make you look like an idiot by hoarding anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment in your life toward people? You see, the sad thing is that Satan has deceived us into believing that we could enlarge our horizons by experiencing life more fully and, 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 and by accomplishing things outside of God's will for our life. And that's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden. Satan's power of persuasion or ability to deceive must have been enormous He convinced Adam and Eve if they were out from under God's authority, they would become free. They could set up shop on their own, in their own power, in their own ability. They could write their own script. They could live their own life as they wanted to without God looking over their shoulder, without having to contend with him in the cool of the day. They could live their life without him. And one of the sad things that I see today that there are people that I believe with all of my heart, I believe with all of my heart, I believe with all of my heart that that they are saved. They know Jesus as their personal Savior, but they have fallen into the Adam and Eve trap and they're trying to live their life saved out from under the authority of the God who saved them. Listen carefully. Because what is true of Adam and Eve then is also true of us today. <clears throat> the lost person, now listen, the lost person or the saved person. He said, Preacher, I I don't think I'm going to like this statement you're getting ready to make. Well, get over it because it's coming your way. The lost person or the saved person who tries to find peace and happiness and fulfillment apart from being under the authority of God 
is like chasing fireflies in the night. He's pursuing clouds with no rain. He's trying to draw water from wells that have gone dry. The reason there is so much emptiness in the world today is because people have abandoned God. We are living in a society today that's stumbling through life as, as living with no convictions, trying to manufacture a little happiness for themselves, but it cannot be found. We are a society who is looking in all the wrong places, as I said earlier. Jesus met this woman one day at a well. <clears throat> John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said to this woman, a lesson in a life of emptiness. And this is what he said, as he had this water, this woman had drawn some water, he asked him to give him a drink, and, and they had this religious discussion and then Jesus made this statement. Listen to, to me carefully. He said, whomever drinks of this water, this water, he, he was talking about himself. He said, whoever drinks of this water shall never thirst again. But that didn't start the conversation. Now, I want, you to, I want you to listen how he started the conversation. He said, whoever drinks of this water, this carnal water, this, this, this pleasures of life, this water that you just got out of that well represents the ground, the carnality, will still be thirsty. Jesus is saying that the person without under the authority of God or without God in his life can go to the best wells the world has to offer and drink and drink and drink and drink again. But in a little while, he's going to be thirsty again and he'll have to go back to that well or another well, the best wells the world has to offer. Jesus said the best the world has to offer is going to leave you empty and thirsty. But he, he said something else. He said, but whoever drinks of this water that I shall give him. The water of knowing and receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, which results in the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. Jesus said, shall never thirst in the water that I shall give him. Listen, we'll be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Listen, I don't know how to explain this. I'm sure there's a theologian out there somewhere that must. I hadn't met him yet. Now, I want you to listen carefully. I want you to get, try to wrap your mind around this with me. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, when we devote ourselves to bringing God's highest pleasure about 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4 says that God gives us a part of himself. You remember that I made this statement early on that there was a part of our heart that God reserved just for him. You remember that statement I made? Now listen 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 4 tells us what happens to that place, that emptiness in your life. And this is what he said, by which we are, by which are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these you might watch this carefully, you might be partakers of his divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. There it is. 
when you were created in your mother's womb and you became that little person. In that little heart, <coughs> in that little bitty heart in your mother's womb, God set aside. God set aside in that little heart a little place for himself. A God that the Bible says cannot be contained in houses and buildings. In that womb, in that tiny, tiny heart, God reserved a place for himself. I'm going to tell you something, folk. If this don't get you excited, I know a couple other churches you probably would feel comfortable in. <laughs> and then something happened. And after nine months or so, more or less, your mother screamed and hollered, and there you were, and you knew life was going to treat you well because you got slapped before you ever could scream. I think that's what the reason my life went downhill. I, I got whooped before I could ever even whoop back, you know. So I've been trying to make it up ever since. <clears throat> Laying on that bed waiting for the doctor to cut that umbilical cord, there was a little heart that had a place reserved. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, there's still that place in your heart. God is waiting so patiently. He just wants to come home. He gave heaven's best for you to be able to have an opportunity for him to come home. In that place he reserved for himself. One day, <coughs> in a little country church, a nine-year-old kid come walking down an aisle out of a church that was maybe as big as that platform if you took the chairs off. And I told the preacher I wanted to be saved. And he said, you believe Jesus died for you? And I said, yes. Pow! Bang! <laughs> Closed. God moved in. That's not the end of the story. Because this book that I preach out of in Ephesians chapter 1 said that, that I, the Holy Spirit took up residence in my life and he became the seal. When God moved in to this reserved place in my innermost being, when I invited Jesus in, the Holy Spirit came in, pow, sealed. Sealed that place where God moved in. He is the seal of my salvation. And because he's the seal of my salvation, instantaneously I was predestined for heaven. You'd say, preacher, you don't think, you don't think we know about you? Honey, everybody knows about me. Because I tell everybody. I tell everybody about me. I shared my testimony this week, Thursday, while I was just sitting in there. There was a new person that was, they, that was first day she had come in to take my stuff down. And this said, the lady that normally comes, she was with her. And she said, 
and this is Mr. Black, and this is Miss so and so and so and so. And she said, You ought to hear his story. And I said, I can tell it to you. <laughs> and in just about three minutes, I shared how I was saved and, and then how I went to join gangs and do drugs and alcohol and ended up in a psycho ward for drugs and had to leave California to keep him going to prison for grand theft auto. And she said, wow, that's a story. And I said, no, that's grace amazing. You say, well, what about all that? Listen, listen. I was at that little place right there where God had taken up residence was still sealed. Sealed with the Holy Ghost. Sealed. You say, well, how you know? Because you see, it wasn't sealed based on my performance. It was sealed based on the sovereignty of God. And in life's most difficult times, I know that I know that I know that I'm a child of the living God and I couldn't do anything to cause him to love me any less because I didn't do anything to cause him to love me anymore. <laughs> if you're in this place today and you already know that you're a child of the living God, He's still there. If you're struggling trying to find your identity and that you are a child of the living God, mm, you're going to listen to me talk about I, There's a series of sermons coming down the road. I can tell you it's coming. I've already got them done. And it's called Kingdom Living. The reason you're struggling is you're trying to live out from under the authority of God. The reason you aren't finding your peace and your fulfillment and, 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 and all those other things that you're searching for, is you're trying to find it out from under the authority of God in your life. If you're here today and you've never invited Jesus Christ to come into your life, forgive you of your sins and make you a Christian, I beg you today. God is calling. The Holy Spirit of God speaks to you very quickly, very quietly, but screaming to you. God wants to come home. He has reserved for himself a place in your innermost recesses that God calls your heart. Would you allow him to come in in the person of the Holy Spirit through simple childlike faith in the finished work of Jesus? I encourage you. Do not leave this place today lost without Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Hands bowed, eyes closed. If you'll make this your prayer, I want you to lift your hand straight up. One hand is a little bit shorter than the other one up here because it didn't want to go straight up. Eyes closed, say it out loud with me, Father. In the name of Jesus. I pray that I will be rooted and built up in Jesus, established in faith and following your will for my life. I can because I know that I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who loved me. In Jesus' name, amen. Whatever God's put on your heart today, I want you to step out from where you are and make your way to the front. If God is speaking to you about salvation, please come. If he's speaking to you about church membership, please come. Whatever God's put on your heart today, I want you to step out from where you are, make your way to the front. You come right now as God speaks to you.